everyone and welcome to the Hudson River. My name is Laurel Zima. I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory of Columbia University. And today I am standing on the end of Piermont Pier where we have our Hudson River Field Station. Now I've brought you along on this journey to the Hudson today because I wanted to talk about how amazing this feature and habitat is that we have right here in New York State. So the Hudson, while it's called a river, it's actually an estuary, which means that we have salty seawater coming in from the Atlantic Ocean, and we have fresh water that's coming into the Hudson, draining from the entire Hudson River watershed. Now, because we have a mix of fresh and salty and brackish water, which is a mix of fresh and salty water, this creates a diversity of habitats and makes the Hudson such a unique place for so many different species. We are actually gonna be talking about one of those species today, um, which is an incredible fish that uses the Hudson for part of its life. Now, this fish is prehistoric. It was swimming in the waters around the same time that dinosaurs were roaming the earth. So we like to call this fish a dinosaur fish. So which species is this? Let's dive right in and find out. So we have now made our way into the Hudson River Field Station. And before we introduce our dinosaur fish, I just want to give you a little spatial reference of where we are located. So this is a topographic map. You can feel the topography changes of the landscape as well as the bathymetry or the depths of the Hudson River. Now this map is not a picture of the entire Hudson. It's only looking at as far north as Anthony's nose and as far south as the Palisades uh, Palisades, New York, where Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory main campus is located. Our Hudson River Field Station is located at the end of Piermont Pier, right here. Now, the reason why we have this section of the Hudson as a topographic map is because this wide bays area is such an important habitat for our dinosaur fish and a bunch of other species um, that live in the Hudson. So we call this the wide bays section that's comprised of Havistraw Bay and Tappan Zee Bay. And while we identify them as separate bays, they're really connected into this one wide section of the Hudson. In fact, this is the widest section of the Hudson here in Havistraw Bay, stretching out to about three miles wide. Um, this section is also extremely shallow and you can tell because the light blue is uh, denoting a shallow water area, whereas this darker, deeper section of the Hudson is a deep, deep water channel. So you can see most of the area in this wide bay section is pretty shallow and very wide. Um, it also is very nutrient rich and has high turbidity, which is the cloudiness of the water. Both of these are very important because nutrients is a great source of food for a lot of different species and turbidity can actually help camouflage smaller species of fish or juvenile fish from getting gobbled up by predators. And this section is actually that brackish water section that we had just talked about. And all of these characteristics of the wide bays really makes it an amazing habitat and a perfect fish nursery. In fact, New York State actually designated this uh, Havistraw Bay area as the most critical habitat on the entire Hudson because of its ecosystem rarity and use by vulnerable species. Um, it's also been recognized by the entire eastern seaboard as a critical nursery area for migrating fish. And our dinosaur fish happens to be a vulnerable species and a migrating fish. So what is our special species we're gonna be talking about today? Our dinosaur fish is the Atlantic sturgeon. Atlantic sturgeon are a prehistoric fish that ancestors have been around for 245 million years. Um, the Atlantic sturgeon that we know today has been virtually unchanged for the past 120 million years and have even outlived the dinosaurs far after they've been extinct. So you can see why we call this the dinosaur fish. Sturgeon are a benthic dwelling species, which means they live at the bottom of the Hudson. Uh, this sturgeon has a lot of physical characteristics that helps him to live and search for food along the bottom of the Hudson, including clams, crustaceans, worms, mollusks, and insects. The first feature that a sturgeon has is this flattened shovel-like snout that helps to dig throughout the riverbed looking for food. 
They're also equipped with these four barbells, which are a fleshy sensory organ that are attached to its snout that are housed with taste buds to help them look for food in the river bottom sediments or in turbine water conditions. Atlantic sturgeon also have these scoots along the top and the side body. Um, scoots are bony plates with these ridges on top, which make them look even more like a dinosaur. Um, now these scoots are a great form of protection against any predators, although Atlantic sturgeon don't really have many Hudson River predators as adults. The Atlantic sturgeon also has a series of fins, many fins that other species of fish have as well. The first is the dorsal fin, um, which is positioned at the top of the sturgeon's body. The dorsal fin helps prevent the sturgeon from rolling over as it swims. The other fins that this fish have are pectoral fins. So these fins are on the side body of the sturgeon, right behind his gills. Um, pectoral fins work to steer the sturgeon and help keep the sturgeon off of the bottom of the river. They also have these pelvic fins, which help the sturgeon to move up and down in the water column. This anal fin back here um, helps to stabilize the fish while swimming. And finally, the caudal fin, or the tail, is used to propel the sturgeon throughout the water. But this caudal fin is actually a unique shape that also helps the sturgeon to stay on the bottom of the river. Now these Atlantic sturgeon can be massive. They can grow to 16 feet in length and weigh over 800 pounds. Um, they can even live to be 60 years old. Atlantic sturgeon are an anadromous migrating fish, which means they're born in fresh water. Um, they migrate out to the ocean once they reach adulthood, and that's where they will spend the majority of their adult lives. Um, but they will eventually return to the estuaries where they were born once they reach sexual maturity to spawn themselves. The range for Atlantic sturgeon is huge. They can live as far north as Canada and as far south as Florida, with the Hudson River estuary being one of the estuaries that they really rely on for spawning. Actually, a 2007 report found of the 562 Atlant juvenile Atlantic sturgeon netted over three years in New York, 90% of them were found in Haverstraw Bay. So Atlantic sturgeon will actually spend the first two to six years of their 60 to 100 year lives in Havistraw Bay specifically because there's so much food and it's a great habitat for them to live. As you're finding, Atlantic sturgeon have characteristics that are more closely aligned with a K-selected species. So they have long lifespans, they're slow to reach sexual maturity, and they have few offspring. Uh, for example, a female Atlantic sturgeon in the Har uh, Hudson River estuary area won't reach sexual maturity until she's about 16 to 18 years old, and then she'll only spawn every three to five years. So you can see species with this, these characteristics are more vulnerable to endangerment if they're subjected to high fishing pressures with little management. And unfortunately, this is the story for Atlantic sturgeon. Their numbers have severely declined since the 1900s for a variety of reasons. Um, one being vessel strikes, these animals are large and slow swimming in the water. So if a boat is going too fast and not paying attention, they could actually hit an Atlantic sturgeon. Bycatch is another threat, which is the unintentional catch of a species when you're actually targeting something else. Well, they were also historically subjected to overfishing. So people sought after Atlantic sturgeon for their um, fleshy meat, which was known as Albany beef or their roe or fish eggs, which was referred to as black gold in the Hudson. Because they were such slow swimmers, they were really easy targets for fishermen, so they were able to catch them at an overabundance before this population could spawn and replenish this fish stock. Habitat loss is another threat to Atlantic sturgeon. Um, dams have been built all throughout the Hudson River and its um, connecting tributaries and streams which have prevented some of these Atlantic sturgeon from entering um, areas of the estuary where they were born to complete that spawning cycle. And in addition, shoreline construction has really changed um, the habitat that these sturgeon need and require to spawn. In 2012, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, listed Atlantic sturgeon as federally endangered along parts of the eastern U.S., including the Chesapeake Bay, New York Bight, Carolinas and South Atlantic, making it illegal to fish them or to take their eggs from these areas. While listed as endangered, their population have been slow to recover because of other existing threats, including 
bycatch, climate change, habitat loss, and a variety of other human activities. Both fisheries management and ongoing research is critical to foster the recovery of the Atlantic sturgeon. Luckily for us, researchers from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation Hudson River Fisheries Unit work to collect data about Atlantic sturgeon through a variety of surveys to better understand how and where they're using the Hudson River estuary. This helps us to make better informed management decisions. Now, if this is something that interests you, you too could become a fisheries biologist. Uh, now I'm going to share a short clip from the New York State DEC all about their research with Atlantic sturgeon. People have been catching sturgeon for a variety of reasons for millennia. Today, biologists use this pop-up satellite tag to study sturgeon habits and migration. Sturgeon that have been tagged in the freshwater Hudson River estuary in June by January have been found as far south as Georgia, as far north as the Bay of Fundy, or sometimes just off the Jersey Shore. Uh, my name is Amanda Higgs. I'm a fisheries biologist with the Hudson River Estuary Program. I grew up on the Hudson River. My parents always had a boat. We were out on the river all the time, and I, I love the river. So when I was able to start working on it, that was like really kind of really awesome. People should care about sturgeon because they're the largest fish in the Hudson River. They've been around since the time of the dinosaurs, and they're just an awesome fish. So when we go out to net for adult sturgeon, we are trying to catch whatever's here in the river. So sturgeon use the river to spawn, lay eggs. And when we go out, we try to catch the males and females that are here. We set our nets uh, when the water slows down, put them in and wait about an hour, hour and a half. And then we start to uh, pull the nets in. Any fish that we catch, we try to uh, put a rope around its tail once the rope's around its, its tail, it's, we're able to control the fish and the fish can't swim off. So we catch them, we measure them, we weigh them, uh, and we put them back to go on to spawn. We don't want to uh, keep them or hurt them or anything, but just to get an idea of what's here uh, spawning. What I love most about my job is that we're trying to preserve the species for future generations. So uh, management and research helps us manage the fishery but also our research part of our my job is to learn more about why fish use the river and where they use it so we can help protect those areas so there can be some recovery of the species.